All right, Dr. Lori Mintz, I am just tickled to welcome you to the Better Podcast. Welcome, Doc. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I have to say, I have been following uh, your work uh, for quite some time, and I wanted to reach out to you to have you come on the show, because I think that there is such a important conversation to be had with the women. So we have primarily a female audience. So we have mothers, we have clinicians, but also, so we want to have that conversation around being clitorate, which we're going to talk about what that defi- what that means. You've written uh, literally the book on clitoracy. And I also think that it's important for us to be talking, if we are mothers, to be having this conversation with our teenagers, with our children, you know, our daughters, our sons, um, so that we can begin to um, really understand how pleasure and orgasm is experienced differently uh, across the sexes. So I'm, I'm just thrilled that you're here. And I think that we're going to have a really, really juicy conversation today. Well, I'm thrilled to be here and I love your work and I'm really honored to be here and talk about all things clitorate with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we, before we dive in, I think it's, uh, and I, I was saying to this to you in the pre-chat, I know your history, uh, that you're a tenured professor, that you have, you know, an extensive amount of clinical uh, background, but for my Bettys, for the audience, um, give us a little backstory in terms of how you ended up writing a book on Clitoracy and the book titled, uh, just so everyone is clear, that the title is called Becoming Clitorate Why Orgasm Equality Matters and How to Get It. So, how did you end up writing uh, a book with this subject title or subject so, matter? So, as you, as you said, I'm a licensed psychologist. Um, I see clients for general and sexual issues. I'm a certified sex therapist, and I'm also a tenured professor at the University of Florida where I teach the psychology of human sexuality to hundreds of students a year. And honestly, it was my students that inspired me to write this book. It was their stories, their pain, their successes, their questions. Um, In a nutshell, uh, when I started teaching this class about 10 years ago, I was shocked. I mean, I was taken aback at how little these students knew about sex in general, but especially about female pleasure and how many myths there were out there. And I, when I taught about the orgasm gap, the, you know, consistent finding in the literature that when women and men get it on, the women are having fewer orgasms than the women. It, it really stopped being an academic concept. It became, these were real people in pain. The women, because they felt broken and they weren't having orgasms, the men, because they weren't, quote, giving women orgasms. So I started teaching to female pleasure, to closing the orgasm gap, to the clitoris. And the notes I got from students were so powerful. Thanks to your class, I'm orgasmic. Thanks to your class, I don't feel broken anymore. Thanks to your class, my girlfriend's orgasmic. And it was that that inspired me to say, well, if my students at the University of Florida need this information, there's probably a lot of people who do. So it was my students who truly, truly inspired me with their, um, the privilege of them sharing their lives with me. It's so often the case I find that, uh, so I was in clinical practice as a chiropractor for 16 years and my patients were often my best teachers, right? And it sounds very similar where your students, you know, you go in as, as the teacher, the one who is delivering the information. And if you're open to it, of course, you allow yourself also to be taught. Um, and what a beautiful gift, um, that they were able to give you and that in turn, you've been able to give, uh, so many, and so let's let's talk a little bit. You've popularized this term, clitorate or clitoracy. Uh, also, have coined, as far as I'm aware, you've coined the, the the term orgasm equality. So let's actually start with the definitions of these two terms. What is clitoracy? What is orgasm equality? And why do these matter? Okay, wonderful. Well, the term, the first thing I want to say is while I may have popularized the term, I need to give credit where credit is due. I did not make the term up. The term was first used by Ian Kerner, 
who is the author of the book, She Comes First, A Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman, which is basically an oral how-to sex manual. It's fantastic. And he used that term on the back cover of his book in about 2004. And when I was writing my book, I wrote him and I said, can I use this term? And he said, of course you can, because at the more people who become clitorate, the better the world will be, have at it. So thanks to Dr. I, to Ian Kerner for that. Um, but what is clitoracy? It's a play on the words literate and clitor, the clitoris. So to be clitorate is to be open about, knowledgeable about female orgasm and female pleasure because the clitoris is our primary uh, erotic organ. Um, according to much research, all orgasms, no matter where the stimulation is coming from, involve the clitoris. So that's what clitorisy is. And orgasm equality, it's the opposite of the orgasm gap. So the orgasm gap is the consistent finding. And there's so much research and I can cite some stats if you want. But that when women and men get it on, the women are having, as I mentioned earlier, way fewer orgasms than the men. So orgasm equality, and it is like equalizing, getting rid of the gap so that women and men have equal opportunities for pleasure and orgasm. That doesn't mean that every time you have a sexual encounter, both people have to orgasm because that's pressure and pressure and sex don't work, um, go well. So I'm not talking about orgasm equality in individual bedrooms. People sometimes misunderstand that. You're not say, keeping oh, score. We're not, we're not right, keeping score right, exactly. here. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about the cultural at a cultural right. level. Right. Well, I think that's interesting. In your book, you you talk about, um, and we can get into it. I would love for you to get geeky with stats. Like this is a geeky okay, audience. Um, you you talk about, I believe uh, on the low end, uh, it's 4%. And then I think on the high end, it was less than 20. I want to say it's 18% of women who orgasm solely from penetration alone. And then I think that you, you know, you can even make the argument that maybe even the penetration is stimulating the clitoris in some way. Uh, we could talk about the G spot. We could talk about how the, we'll get to the anatomy of the, of the clitoris in a moment. Um, and you know, maybe in this encounter, uh, when a woman is, um, when there's a, a man and a woman that are together, there's things like, you know, a couple's vibrator, maybe there's visual they're watching erotica together. Um, but there's some stimulation of the clitoris in some way. Um, and I wanted to, uh, sort of double underline that if you will, and <laughs> highlight that because I think that a lot of, uh, uh, and, and maybe we can, maybe we can talk a little bit about porn, but, uh, and sort of the lessons that we, that we extract from porn. But I think that so many of us feel like, Hey, I should be able to have this, you know, in orgasm after just like my partner is after like a couple of minutes of working. Right. And the female pleasure doesn't necessarily work that way. And if you are someone who traditionally or most consistently orgasms from some type of clitor like clitoral stimulation, there's nothing wrong with you. Like that's, that's how it works. Right. Right. Yeah. So in terms of the stats, exactly. Let me really underline this, you know, double um, underline. This is what I do yeah, in important so, points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in the old days, we used to hear the stat all the time that only 25% of women can orgasm from intercourse alone. But those older studies never asked people like, are you also getting your clitoris stimulated during intercourse by rubbing it against a body part like your partner's penis or by stimulating itself yourself with a hand or vibrator? So the newer studies that do say, can you orgasm from just a thrusting penis alone? There's been a few studies and those give the 15 to 18% range in those two studies. But I had this idea that even asking the question that way is going to put pressure on people because the cultural norm is we, quote, should orgasm from penetration alone. Right. So I started asking a question that was much more, I thought, neutral 
which is what's your most reliable way to orgasm? And then the choices were um, penetration alone, penetration plus clitoral stimulation, clitoral stimulation alone. And when I asked that question, the average, so I've gotten, I've asked that question to thousands and thousands and thousands of people in different contexts, my own class, workshops I've given, speeches I've given. I've had the range be 0%, say penetration alone is their most reliable, to like 4%. The average is in my book, I said the average was 4%. The more I've asked, collected the data, it's gone down a little. Mm. So it's a, like 3 to 4% only say, or maybe 2 to 4% say inner penetration alone. The vast majority, 96% requ- of us require clitoral stimulation, either alone or coupled with penetration. And But yet we have this orgasm hierarchy, right? Like those of us, I hate when people say, oh, I'm one of the 4%, I'm lucky. No, don't say that because that's like saying that's the rare way is the better way, you know? Um, And so theoretically we have this like, you know, oh, that's the best way. Well, if you pair intercourse and clitoral stimulation, blended orgasm, second best, clitoral stimulation alone, oh, you're the loser, And what's really interesting is I have spoken to so many women. I've never seen this written in the literature, but after I published this data and published my book, I have spoken to many, many women who say, not only am I the clitoral stimulation alone type, I cannot orgasm with something in my vagina. It distracts me from the feeling of clitoral stimulation. And I feel ashamed of that. And, you know, my mission isn't to make anyone feel ashamed. If you're in the 4%, good for you. If you're in the 43% that's clitoral plus intercourse, good for you. If you're clitoral alone, good for you. However, you orgasm is fine. And no one should be telling you one way is preferred over the other. Yeah. You can't orgasm wrong. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's no that. wrong you way to do it. <laughs> oh, I love that. Can I quote you on that? Absolutely. It's, it's yours. Huh? And I think it's such a clever way of asking the question because it, you know, when you, when you start off asking, Hey, is it penetration that gets you off? Then there's already an inherent bias in the question, like, is this good for you or not? Versus I'm not going to name the intervention, but I'm going to give you a list of things to choose from. And it's a much, as you said, it's a much more neutral way of asking the question. And I think that this is a good uh, place to maybe talk about some of the some of the societal um, pressures and messages that we get around penetrative sex, because I think that um, um, and maybe this is a, a time to, to talk about porn because I often, you know, I've said this on previous podcasts when we've had sex experts on, uh, or, you know, just having, um, you know, a chat about hormones with, you know, with thought leaders is that porn is just a laughable rendering of what most porn, I'll say most porn, you know, male directed porn, classic porn is is a laughable rendering of what fle- female pleasure is. It's like within a couple of minutes, she's screaming and it's like, that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. And most, and I would say I, you know, most men watch porn growing up. This is, you know, we have sex ed, which is just like, here's the banana. And this is how you put the, here's how you put the condom on, you know, like that's pretty much the extent of it. You maybe learn about your menstrual cycle. And, um, and we, we learn a lot of how things work, if you will, outside of school from our peers who know no more than you do. And we, and we learn from porn. So let's, let's talk a little bit about when I say classic porn, uh, what are some of the problems with the teachings, like the, what we can extract from porn in terms of female pleasure and orgasm? Yeah, that is, I, I, you are singing my song because You know, I often say like in most movies and porn, there's like little fooling around. The man puts his penis in the woman's vagina and she's like instantly like having an orgasm. (laughs) And in real life, that wouldn't happen. And not only would it not be orgasmic, there might be pain from having penetration that completely right. 
Completely. So, yeah. So what is what does it show about female pleasure? It shows falsehoods. And, you know, while it might be arousing to watch for, you know, it's not education, you know, there's like the saying out there, I don't know who coined it, I've posted it myself, like, you would not learn to drive from a Fast and Furious movie, like you should not learn (laughs) how to have sex from porn. And, you know, porn isn't inherently problematic. I mean, there's all kinds of like moral arguments and research, but the bottom line is, it can be very helpful for some people to become aroused, but the problem is when it's used as a role model at right. first. And that is unfortunately what young people are doing. And of course they are. If we're not giving them accurate sex ed, they're gonna to turn to the internet. And the internet has tons of false information and porn is, it is, it's a laughable rendition of female pleasure. There was actually some studies that did a, um, there's actually an orgasm gap in porn. A lot of the porn show men orgasming more than women. And the ones that do show women orgasming, again, fast and furious penetration, pumping hard. That's not how most women come. And even more dangerous than that, I think, are the scenes where there's anal intercourse Mm -hmm. without any warm up, without any consent without any preparation and the man just sticks his penis in an unprepared anus. And I have a friend, a very dear friend, who's a a gynecologist. She said she's seeing young women come in with injuries because of this, Mm -hmm. you know? um, And so when people use porn as a role model for sex, so the least harmful thing is that you're not going to have an orgasm. Then we have get sexual pain and then we've got actual injuries. And result. there's violence too. Like you were saying like the pumping and the pumping and it's like the harder he thrusts, you know, the, 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 the stronger her orgasm is often portrayed that way. Like the harder he's sort of, you know, penetrating her that the, the stronger the orgasm might be. And that's, you know, we can talk about how that also, I think, negatively affects men because they're going to think, God, like in order, because I don't think that men inherently are saying, well, I don't care about my partner's pleasure. I would argue the opposite. I would think that so many men um, take pride in their ability to to bring their partner to orgasm and to give her pleasure. But it's just a lack of you know, to your point, it's this lack of role modeling. We see like the, you know, the lack of lubrication, the lack of preparation. If it's, you know, if we're talking about anal sex or we're talking about even just, you know, vaginal sex. Um, and this, you know, you see stuff like, I mean, you just see horror, like choking and you just see all of these different things that maybe for some, and I I don't want to pat, you know, if that's, you know, if that's what gets you off, like, all the more power to you. But I would say that when that becomes the norm, when that becomes like, oh, well, everybody must like this because I've seen it in 17 different movies. Um, and there's no education around it. There's no communication or we don't have the skills or the tools to say, Hey, do you like this? Like, can we try this? Like, how does this feel? What's going on for you right now? Then I, I think we, 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 we move into fake orgasm territory. And I, I saw something that you had posted uh, on your Instagram. You had said something like, girls, you did not get through a pandemic <laughs> to fake your orgasms. And I was like, that's, I mean, we should never be faking our orgasms. But on the other side, it's like, what do you expect? You know, like if someone's on top of you and they're thrusting and it's starting to hurt, you're going to be like, I need to get, I need to stop this right now. I need to arch my back, moan and scream so that he can stop. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything you say, I resonate with so completely. And, and, you know, the part, let me start with the part about men caring, like, I mean, there's so much narrative out there that the orgasm gap in, is due to men not caring. I think just the opposite. Sure, there's a few that don't. And as I say, if you find one, run, you know. <laughs> Slowly the, back that, away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the majority really do care. In fact, they care so much that their masculinity, there's research that, quote, giving a woman an orgasm, which is also a problematic term, like causes men to feel more masculine. They really care, but they're misguided because of the same porn images. And it puts a lot of pressure on them 
about giving a woman an orgasm by lasting long and thrusting and then making them enjoy sex less. It's so funny we're talking about this today because just this week I had the opportunity and honor and pleasure to talk about female pleasure to, at a fraternity house. Oh, good. Amazing. A hundred fraternity brothers. Um, and I, and I, they, I asked them at the beginning, you know, some questions like, do you like sex? Do you think about sex? You know, get things warmed up. And I said, raise your hand if the only thing you care about is your own pleasure during sex. Okay. Two men raised their hands. Now, then I said, raise your hand if you only care about your female, your partner's pleasure. About two men raised their hand. I said, raise your hand if you want both of you to have good time. The rest of the 96 men raised their hands. And then I said, and how many of you think that the way to give both yourself and your partner a good time is for you to have a big penis, thrust hard and last long? And almost all of them raised their hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's the gap. There's the, there's the misinformation and it's not, this is not male bashing. It's like the men want it. They want to know, they want to know what's working for, for us, how it works. Like I, 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 I believe that this is everything that you're saying. I've experienced like my partner is, he feels amazing. Like he's so happy. He takes a lot of pride, um, in, in, in my pleasure and mine in, and I take in his as well. So how do we, how do we stop this vicious circle? How do we, how do we stop women faking orgasms? And how do we also teach women how to begin to advocate for their own pleasure? And I know that this is very complicated and layered, but where, where can we start? So first of all, we start with things like this podcast, right? We start with education. And unfortunately, we don't have good sex ed in the schools. You know, they do in other countries and those countries don't have as big an orgasm gap. You know, here we teach people abstain and it's bad and it's dangerous and all this. And we don't ever even learn about the clitoris or pleasure or anything. So once we have sex ed, that's better. I think things will be better. In the meantime, I think it's up to people like me and you to get the word out there to educate people. Um, and what do we need to educate them? We need to educate them about women's genital anatomy, pleasure, uh, consent, communication, all of that. And that's how we're going to close the gap culturally. And then in terms of, and I can circle back to any of this, and then in terms of individuals, I think we need to not only give them the knowledge, but the empowerment to believe that their pleasure is equally important as their partner's pleasure and give them the tools, including the way they think about sex, um, that it is equal for both. Being able to shut off your busy brain using mindfulness or fantasy, masturbation, so you know what you like. Then being able, like this is something I advocate all the time. And it seems so obvious, but it's too often understated that the most essential way to orgasm is to get the same type of stimulation alone as you get with a partner. And so many times we know from research, this is mind blowing, less than 1% of women pleasure themselves exclusively by putting something in their vagina, less than 1%. The rest use external stimulation alone or coupled with internal stimulation. Yet when with male partners, we're like, oops, let, we don't need that. We'll just get it all through intercourse. So, you know, changing the scripts to turn taking scripts. Um, so we're not, you know, so there's so many cultural and individual ways to fix this problem. And it's, it's, it is such a fixable problem. I think so too. And, you know, you were talking about our education system and it, when I, when I was growing up and this is slightly, it's not about sex, but alcohol consumption in my family. We were given, you know, my, uh, part of my background is Portuguese. They would make their own house wine. So they would make, they would grow their grapes in the back. They would, you know, kind of like Lucy in I Love Lucy, she'd be like stomping on the grapes, you know, like they do that in the backyard, make their own house wine. And I would have some of that. It was never a big deal. So at a you know, 10 year old, you know, yes, technically it's illegal. Uh, please don't call, you know, social services on my parents, but they would, they would, get, it was just part of the culture. 
she can have a little bit, whatever with dinner. And so when I was 18 and, um, you know, of, of legal drinking age, friends around me were getting absolutely shit faced because, and part of my, part of my French, but they were getting absolutely wasted because they had, it had been this elusive thing that they were never allowed to get near. And then they went off to college or university and it was like, now, now I'm going to make up for lost time. And I never had that because it was like, I've had this for dinner with my parents. Like this is not, this is, this is not something that's so, I don't want, I don't want to feel like that. I don't want to look like that. Um, and I think that the same is true with sex education. When we talk about, when we talk about it from a, um, maybe from a more, I'll say vanilla, (laughs) maybe from, you know, when we're talking about ice cream flavors, you know, we just, we just do the vanilla, like here's the banana, here's the condom. This is what your menstrual cycle is rather than, and of course, I mean this in an age appropriate way, but we talk about pleasure. We talk about the differences in pleasure. My, my, I have sons, uh, they know already, they know of course, all of their own anatomical parts. We don't call them PPs and we don't like, it's like penis and testicles, uh, urethra. We've talked about the prostate before. They also know the anatomical terms for women and it's not just vagina. It's vulva. The vulva is the exterior. You have, you know, the, the clitoris and the, and we've, we've, I use those words because I think it's important for men and women. And, you know, of course I'm raising sons. So it's important for, you know, as a mother, I want my children to be good lovers when they're older, you know? So I want them to also understand what it means to be able, um, to please a woman. If that's, you know, if that's the partner that they choose and all of that. But I think it's important for them to understand the anatomy. So all that preamble to say, maybe we can talk a little bit about the anatomy. You know, one of the steps in becoming cliterate is to actually examine, um, the anatomy of the clitoris. And I know I'm referencing your Instagram account a lot because it's so freaking good. You're, you have a, a, an image there with, you know, there's a man and there's like the moon or the sun is setting in the background and he's like, try, he's like taking a selfie and he's trying to, you know, like put his fingers around it. And it's like, just like the moon's here. And if, if you're watching this on video, like the moon's here and he's like, look, you know, which is a sad commentary on um, how much men, you know, actually understand about the clitoris. So let's talk about the anatomy let's break some misconceptions up. Talk to us about, um, how it's not just like a little dot hidden under a hood. Yeah. So let's back up even more if that's okay. So the external part of your genital anatomy is called a vulva, not a vagina. Yes. Uh, this is so important. I think because we call our entire genitals a vagina And by doing that, we're linguistically erasing the parts of ourselves that give us the most pleasure. And and, and we're naming our genitals after the part that gives men, not us, the most pleasure. It means a sheath. Like, it's basically like a penis cozy, you know? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And so what is the vulva? It's the external part, and it's made up of a lot of erotic, touch-sensitive areas, At the very top, you'll have something called the mons pubis, which is like this mound of fatty tissue. And now, does that sound erotic? Probably not, but it is. It's like highly touch sensitive and part of the internal clitoris is sort of right there at the top. Like you can feel it even through once you learn how. That's very erotic. Then we have our inner lips and those are made of the same embryonic tissue is the head of the penis. They're hairless. They're full of uh, touch sensitive nerve endings. We have the vaginal opening, which is also very erotic, full of touch sensitive nerve endings. And then what I call the star of the show, the clitoris, right? The external clitoris. And if you follow the inner lips up, the inner lips actually form the clitoral hood, which covers the glands. The hood is analogous to the male uh, foreskin if it isn't removed in circumcision. And the clitoral glands is analogous to the head of the penis, except it's much smaller. And it's so it's chock full of so many nerve endings in such a small space that it's often too delicate to touch and people need to touch to the side or on top of the hood or to the left or whatever around it. Um, and so that's the external 
portion. In the internal portion, there's the vaginal canal, of course. And if you want, we can get into the G-spot, which is actually called the clitoral urethral vaginal complex because it's not just a spot. Oh, I and, didn't know that. We have to talk about that. I was yes. not aware of that. Yes. And um, the internal clitoris. The clitoris is a vast internal organ, and it's actually bigger than the penis. It's like, think of it as a big inside penis or think of the penis as a big outside clitoris. That it is a vast, it's not just this little man in the boat they used to call, right? The little tip. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so I hope that gives sort of the overview you were looking what is for. The, what is the name of the G-spot? Say that again. The, the G-spot actual is- real name is called the clitoral urethral vaginal complex, the CUV complex, because why it is, it can, it is an area that includes part of the vaginal wall, part of the internal clitoris, the clitoral legs, and part of the urethral sponge, which is a sponge that wraps around the urethra, which sits on top of the vagina. And that's where it's analogous to the male prostate gland. It's even called the female prostate gland. So it's not just this magic little spot, but breaking it down, you know, we know it's there, but we also know some people can't find it. Some people can, some people find it and gives them vast pleasure. Others find it. It does nothing for them. Um, There's even some evidence that it has an evolutionary basis that it's there to um, decrease the pain in childbirth. There's so much to break down about this, but I think the most important thing is something that the late Betty Dodson said. And I just love Betty Dodson. Um, For anyone who doesn't know who she is, check her out. Um, She said all this media hype around the G-spot has set us back to a Freudian era where we're all looking for this magic spot in our vagina and feeling inadequate if we can't find it. Let's talk about Freud for a moment. (laughs) (laughs) As I put on my war gear. Um, He, in your book, you, um, I'm going to paraphrase this and you'll be able to more eloquently speak to this than I, but in your book, you talk about uh, a statement that he made, which was, uh, something to the effect of at some point women have to uh, give up their reliance on their clitoris and now begin to rely on their vagina essentially as the source of pleasure. Can you speak to me about why, first, why this is inaccurate thinking, why we can physiologically, it is impossible physiologically to say, you know what, I've been seeing out of my eyes and now I'm going to see out of my shoulders. Exactly. How, exactly. <laughs> like why? That is, yes, exactly. Tell me why this, I, I don't know. And, and, you know, you said this, this G spot has set us back, um, years and years. And I think this comes back to this Freudian idea that, um, we can just shift Physio- like that we're just shapeshifters and we can f- shift our, our innervation. Cause even, you know, the innervation, I would, I would imagine the pudendal nerve innervates the clitoris. It's also going to innervate part of the, if not the entire G spot. So it's the same innervation, but I would, Im- and of course, as you mentioned, there's degrees of sensitivity. There's an oscillating degree of how much stimulation, how much nerve stimulation we can get from, um, the CUV, the clit, the clitoris urethral vaginal complex or the G-spot. What is wrong with this line of thinking and how has this impacted female pleasure? Yeah. So female pleasure, there's a long history um, about how it's been filled with myths and devalued, but Freud has really caused, I think, more harm than anyone that in history. Because what he said is exactly what you're saying. He said that as somebody becomes mature, Mm-hmm. We will transfer our sensitivity from our clitoris to our vagina. And you use the exact metaphor I often use. That's like saying once you're mature, instead of breathing out of your nose, you'll breathe out of your ears. Like right. We, right. we don't do that. We don't change the way our bodies work as we age. We don't transfer the function of one organ to another organ. 
but that idea that own that mature women that's how they orgasm is through penetration is so wrong and so sexist you know it's like saying well once you're a grown-up you'll start orgasming the way men do through penetration that's the way because that's the default way yeah and it has really wreaked havoc over centuries and centuries and centuries of us saying this is the wrong way to orgasm and and the g spot you know yes some people find it incredibly pleasurable some don't but it really puts that focus back on if you only do it right you'll be able to do it from something inside your vagina. Which again, puts the penis front and center, right? That this is, right. you know, and, and coming back to this idea of becoming clitorid. So we've talked about the anatomy uh, of the clitoris um, and the surrounding structures, of course, the vulva, the mons pubis, the inner and outer. Are they still called labia majora and minora? That's how I, is that incorrect? Yeah, they or? are. But I like to call them inner lips and outer lips just because it's a lot easier for people to remember. Okay. So but either way. Either way, so we're talking about all of these, it's not just the vagina. And I think, you know, we've been talking, we've been dancing a little bit around language. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a word nerd. I think that language is really, really important. And, you know, when we think about this Freudian approach where we have to bring the, the penis uh, front and center, um, I think that... Um, it, it all comes back to penetrative sex. And, you know, your data is clearly suggesting otherwise, like 96%, I think it was about 96% of women um, are, are able to reach orgasm most consistently through uh, clitoral stimulation uh, alone. So let's talk about some other language um, that I think is important, um, to address here, because I think that women, you know, I've said this in terms of hormones that we've been taught to fear our fertility, but never actually taught how it works. Like I grew up and I'm not throwing, like, I, we don't have to bring religion into this, but I'll, I'll say that I grew up Roman Catholic. And I remember being a young girl thinking that I could get pregnant by going into a swimming pool. Like that was the extent of like my education. And I was scared because I'm like, Oh my God, I don't want to like disappoint my, you know, my parents. So let's, let's, talk about losing your virginity. Let's talk about this term. This term irks me because yeah, I love that term word nerd because that yeah. I so am too. And I, yeah. I think it's so important because I think language um, reflects and perpetuates the sexism in culture around in general and around women's sexuality in specific. So there's so many terms and phrases I take issue with sex foreplay vagina, which, you know, I've alluded to all of those, yeah. but this idea of losing one's virginity. So first of all, you know, whenever I talk about this, people say, well, men lose their virginity too. Like it's not sexist to use that term, but, you know, first of all, we don't, we, we approach the quote loss of virginity for women different than men. For men, it's often like, woohoo, you did it. And for women, there's still slut shaming involved and, you know, how did it happen, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also a really heteronormative term, like that we're making a big deal out of penis and vagina sex, because what then what happens? What about gay and lesbian folks? How do they, quote, lose their virginity? Also, really important, losing like you're losing something, it's negative. Oh, like it's like you've lost your car keys and you're never going to get to drive again. Like something big has been taken away from you. Um, so in some more sex positive European cultures, they call it making your sexual debut, which I love because it's more sex positive, but it still does not get around the idea that we're making putting a penis in the vagina the most important thing. And some are like, well, of course it is because that's how babies are made. But I think the emphasis on it goes way beyond that. It's around the privileging of male sexual pleasure and the importance of intercourse. So um, I suggest in my book that we do use the word having making your sexual debut, but that we make it for your first orgasm with another person or your first pleasurable encounter 
with another person instead of the first time you have a penis in your vagina or put a penis in a vagina. So there's so much wrong with this. And also, as long as we're on the topic, and obviously you can see I have a lot of passion around this, so (laughs) I'll say one more thing. And that is, you know, it's also centered around the idea that hymen breaks and it's some virginity, you know, telltale sign. First of all, that's also anatomically correct. There's a great TED talk called the virginity fraud, I think it is, um, where they the the speakers really break this down. The the hymen is not like a piece of saran wrap that breaks, you know, it's it's a it's a tissue that can stretch. And it, all hymens look different. And you can examine somebody in the hymen of a you know, someone who's never had penetration can look the same as someone who's had 20 years of penetrative sex. So vir- so-called virginity text, um, tests or checks are not only misogynistic and sexist, but they're anatomically, they have no basis in reality. And they can often have severe consequences as well. So I know that there are some cultures that check, you know, after, you know, the husband and wife are married, there's like check for, like they check for blood, you know, they check for the, and which is like, if you've, if you've ridden a horse, if you've like, you know, you've ridden a bike, you know, these, all of these things can influence, um, influence the hymen. And, you know, as you were saying, it doesn't snap and like spontaneously bleed. It can just be stretched and some, some women it's absent and there can be, unfortunately, um, dire consequences. There can be, um, you know, really deleterious consequences to these women that can't prove, you know, that they were virgins, um, before we're talking about abuse. We're talking about death. Yeah. We're talking about huge shame over something that is not consistent. It's not a consistent marker. It's not like drawing blood. And like every time I'm going to be able to measure your glucose, it's like the hymen is different in everybody in the same way that all vulvas don't look, what was the word that you said in the, in the free chat? Was it a clamshell? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We think they're supposed to be like little Barbie clamshells. And right. in fact, there's people doing, oh, it's terrible. The the rise of labiaplasty, which is, you know, the um, surgery to shorten the inner lip so they look more even and petite is on the rise. Why? Probably porn again, because yeah. that's what they portray. And so, you know, what I want to say to anyone listening is it's completely normal for your inner lips to be uneven. It's completely normal for one to stick outside the other. Um, And I talk about this in the book. I say that I have an inner lip that's really big. It sticks out from my outer lip, but it never concerned me because I wasn't raised with this notion that it should look any different. But now I just taught about this in my class and the overwhelming majority of women in my class are self-conscious around how their vulvas looks and it breaks my heart. Right. And we also, we also see this in, in, in the pregnancy realm as well, where you might, um, have, well, I know, I know this used to be practiced because, um, my mother told me that this was offered to her and she was like, get the F away from me. But, you know, with an episiotomy, uh, after the episiotomy, the doctor would say, hey, I'm just going to like put in an extra stitch or two to like tighten you up to, you know, to make you more, uh, you know, to, so you're tighter for your, you know, when you go back to having sex with your husband, which, um, again, sort of brings me to this idea that, um, you know, vaginas are somehow after, after childbirth are somehow these like loose flappy, you know, uh, things that, that don't have elasticity, again, not found in science. There's like, you know, the, the, the entire area we have smooth muscle, we have skeletal muscle, it contracts, it expands. That's what it's designed to open up, to allow the birth canal, to allow for the passage of a baby. And then of course it doesn't, it doesn't always stay 10 centimeters dilated. Like you're not all like permanently effaced, you know? So, uh, speak a little bit about, um, you know, maybe pregnancy and the myth around like loose vaginas, if you will, uh, sure. or even for women who have a lot of sex that happens, you know, it's like, oh, she's loose. Like that's another, like she must be loose if she has, you know, or she enjoys sex. Yes, exactly. I was just going to bring that up. So I'm so glad you did. There's a, two related myths that for, first of all, that you can stretch permanently, like think about it, take a yawn. 
Does your <laughs> mouth stay like that? No, it's it's designed to open and close. Right. And the vagina is elastic, which means it opens and it, you know, it does expand and then it gets smaller again. And having a lot of sex is not going to make your vagina loose. You know, that's so related to the virginity myth. You know, and um, in terms of, I'm not a physician, I'm a psychologist, but in terms of pregnancy, that's also another myth that, like, if you have a baby, your vagina will never be the same. If there is anything that changed, it's usually due to the medical procedures associated with birth, you know, the episiotomies, the stitching, the that kind of thing not because the baby has come out we are designed that way yes yes so if you were if i were to say okay dr mintz you can rewrite the definition of sex you've mentioned this before that oftentimes when we think about sex all we're thinking about is penetrative sex if you could redefine and we often use those two words like sex and intercourse are often like the same thing um, and based on this discussion, um, oral sex, you know, it's called or sex, but it's often, you know, to your point, uh, classified or, cat- you know, it's categorized in foreplay, like before the main event. What, yes. how would you redefine the term sex? If, if you had, if you could rewrite Wikipedia, what, how would you do it? Well, that's so funny because I, that is the first assignment the students in my class have. Oh, no way. You have to write a 60 word definition of sex, like an academic definition. And I tell them it has to be consistent with the research and the thinking, which means it has to be consensual and it has to encompass more than PVI. And then then they have other choices like beyond that, like what body parts are involved, what acts are involved, what's the intent. But for you know and i've gotten some really great definitions over the years but for me it it would be any consensual encounter in which two people give and receive pleasure to one another which you know and you know do the genitals need to be you know it's so funny there's been all kinds of studies about what people consider sex or not and like you know do you consider kissing sex And a lot of people will say no, but then you say, what if it's your partner kissing someone else behind your back? Oh, yes, that's sex. Like what we consider sex is so interestingly context dependent. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's vastly important that both for in terms of inclusivity, in terms of the lesbian, gay, um, trans community, and in terms of equality, in terms of women's pleasure, it is essential we stop using the word sex and intercourse as if they're one and the same. And it's essential we stop using the word foreplay to signify the lead up to this main event. Um, I've talked about this before, and I'm not the first to do so. That, that reflects an overvaluing of male sexual pleasure. If we overvalued female pleasure, we would call foreplay sex and intercourse post play. Oh wow. And I'm not We would call that's... we would call wait, I have to repeat that. If we were prioritizing female pleasure, oral sex would be called sex. Yeah, or manual stimulation, anything in the foreplay realm. Wow. And then the and penetrative part would be post play. Post play. But I'm not suggesting we do that, but I am suggesting we put Women well, and it men certainly changes it. It certainly is like, what the, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think that we want to prioritize both. Like it's right. not about men don't get to have fun because, you know, they, you know, a lot of the male pleasure comes from penetration. And I think that that can be a beautiful experience, but you've been talking, you've said it a couple of times, this like turn taking where it's like, we are going to make sure that you know, she comes or what was, uh, Ian Kerner's name? She, uh, she comes she first, comes first yes. you know, she, maybe she orgasms and then it can be, you know, his turn or whatever, you know, whatever order. This or vice versa. Yeah. You yeah. know, and you know, uh, so yeah, we have to change the script. We have to change the words we use for play intercourse, for play sex. And we have to change the way we do sex because those words are there because they imply 
what's most important. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just say, don't use those words. Use the, use like descriptive words, oral sex, manual stimulation, intercourse, and all of it is sex. What about the last myth? And then I want to move on to some action items. The holy grail (laughs) of intercourse, which is simultaneous climaxing that he's like, okay, honey, like I'm about to come. And then she just like, you know, giddy ups, you know, it's like, oh, I better hurry up. And then she's (laughs) somehow able to, you know, and we see this in porn. It's like silly silliness. Um, But why is this such a fantasy? Why is this such a persistent myth that in order for this session to be like, you know, cosmic, that it has to be both of them, you know, orgasming at the same time? Well, first of all, it's still related to the whole overvaluing of penetrative sex and pleasure, Mm -hmm. because we're all supposed to orgasm the way most men reliably orgasm, not women. I mean, the myth isn't, oh, we'll both orgasm while you're going down on me. (laughs) I mean, that's right. 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 And so it's related to that myth. And, you know, it's both of us should orgasm in the same way. We it's the default, which is false as we've broken down many times. And also Paul Joannidis, the author of the guide to getting it on, he says something that I think is so wise about the uh, myth of the simultaneous orgasm is like, it's, first of all, it's, it's, it's like you're, if you are trying to do that, a you're depriving yourself of the joy of experiencing your partner's pleasure and what they're experiencing. Cause it's really a joy, right. To see your partner have pleasure. And if you're in the middle of your own orgasm, you're not going to really notice it. Also, it's impossible to have an orgasm when you're trying, you need to be fully focused on your own body sensations. That's the greatest irony of good sex is that to have it, you have to be, very internally focused many times on your own body and to think about this. Okay. I'm going to come three, two, one, go. (laughs) Like it just, it doesn't work that way. It really, really doesn't work that way. It's not double Dutch. You can't be like, and, (laughs) and and now, and, and and (laughs) so let's, let's talk about some action items. Um, and you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the myths we've talked about, uh, language. We've talked about anatomy. What are some things that a woman can start doing to help her, uh, to help her own clitoracy? Cause I think it starts with her. Um, and then how does she bring that to her partner? What are some of the first things that we would, that you would want to see a woman doing in sort of reclaiming, if you will, her own self-pleasure? Cause it always starts with us. Um, and then how does she bring that to, uh, to a significant other? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, becoming cliterate is a combination of cultural analysis and self-help. So what you're at to empower women to orgasm. So we've spent a lot of time on the cultural piece and now you're saying, so what about the individual women? And here, let me break it down into like five steps. Now they're not going to be like easy, but these are what sex therapists recommend. So first of all, know what you have, learn your anatomy, take a look at yourself, take a mirror, identify the parts. It takes effort and time. And you, but you, if you don't know what you have, like, how can you enjoy it? How can you teach a partner? So know your anatomy, look at yourself. And if you're like, Ooh, that's icky looking, keep looking till you find yourself beautiful because this idea that vulvas are ugly is also culturally prescribed. That's step one. Step two is working on the sex organ between your mind, in between your mind, between your ears, which is your mind, right? What do I mean by that? Really identify your what you've learned about sex and your unconscious negative thinking. It's dirty. It's just for him. His orgasm is more important. If it's good for him, it's good for me. And really retrain your brain into feeling sex is positive. Sex is this great thing and that you're equally entitled to orgasm. The other part of using your mind is learning to shut it. So think things positively when you aren't having sex, but when you are, shut that busy brain down. 
Like, you know, do I think, do I taste good? Do I look good? Am I taking too long? No, learn to absorb just in your body sensations through mindfulness, maybe some fantasy, whatever you need to turn that busy brain off. So in ma- then masturbation, learn what you need because everybody's vulva is a bit different. Some like stimulation to the right of their clip, some to the left. Masturbation. And then the other two final steps are transferring that master mindful masturbation, transferring that to partner sex through good sexual communication, talking outside of the bedroom and during sex about what you want and changing the scripts. Don't follow the foreplay sex, male ejaculation, sex over turn-taking scripts. She comes first, she comes second. Or if you want to come during the same act, but not the same time, you know, if it's intercourse, use a vibrator during intercourse. So that's how to, that, those are the steps and they're not easy and they're not simple. It's not like one, two, three, right. well, everybody's there. It takes, what we're talking about is retraining yourself um, and re- getting rid of so many falsehoods and shaming things you've learned about sex and yourself. And it takes time, but very well worth the effort and, and very successful strategies. And just like the female orgasm takes a little bit of time, but man, when you get there, it's, <laughs> it was worth the journey, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And I remember watching, I mean, this is years ago, but I remember watching, uh, Oprah Winfrey and they were talking about vibrators and there was this, and I think that this still persists today where the, the men were like, is this going to replace me? Like there was this, um, you know, like you love your vibrator so much, you know, like how am I ever going to be useful? And I would love for you to address that because I think that when we talk about some of the steps, you know, like getting to know your vulva, getting a hand mirror, learning your anatomy, looking like learning your quad, like, is it upper left, right, you know, upper right, like, where do you like stimulation? And you'll probably like it everywhere, but there's going to be preferences that, that you might have. But I think the transferring to the partner, um, very likely, um, I I think that there may be some women listening that might say, okay, what if I just, you know, if I grab my vibrator, well, you know, he's, uh, he's on top of me. And what if he's like, what the hell is that? You know, like, why is that here? Um, how can we assure, um, our men that this is not, um, going to replace them if they are feeling insecure about that? Or do is it that we talk about it before the sexual encounter? Do we just take action during the, where we're just like, I'm just going to reach into my nightstand here and grab my little, my little friend, you know, like how, what are best practices there? And maybe there's not a clear answer, but I'm sure you have some recommendations. I do. And I love the question itself. So First of all, we know from great research by most of this research is conducted by Debbie Herbenek at Indiana University, where Kinsey Institute is. We know that women who have used vibrators have easier and more frequent orgasms. Clitoris loves vibrations. Our clitoris loves the feeling of vibration. By the way, penises do too, because um, they're just outside clitorises. Um, and we also know from Debbie's research that there's a massive correlation between a man's acceptance of his female partner's vibrator use and her sexual satisfaction. So that's super important to underlay. And the bottom line is that vibrators do not replace men. They don't kiss. They don't cuddle. They don't make you laugh. They don't say, I love you. Um, They're just They don't bring you flowers. (laughs) No, right. They don't do any of those things. They don't send you text messages in the middle of the day saying, I love you, babe, I miss you. They don't do any of that. All they do is provide a type of stimulation that penises, hands, and tongues can't provide that clitoris is love. And um, the metaphor I use in my book is if you and your partner were swimming in the swimming pool and you're having a great day and there's a raft in the pool and you're jumping in the raft, off the raft, you know, laying on the raft and kissing, swimming, getting back on the raft, you wouldn't call your girlfriend at the end of the day and go, oh, 
Me and my raft had so much fun. Oh, and my boyfriend was there too, by the way. You wouldn't even mention the raft. And it's the same thing. If you say, I had such great sex last night, and that sex involved a vibrator, you're not going to say, I had the best sex with my vibrator. And my partner happened to be there too. Right. You're not even going to mention the vibrator. It's just, and it's such a myth that it's like an external tool ruins things. Um, it's just a toy. Been, it's just a it's toy. It's just a toy. Yeah, exactly. And there's toys for men too. And here's something a lot of men don't know is if your penis is sort of around the vulva while the woman is stimulating herself, you're going to c- catch what I call some vicarious vibes. And that's going to feel really good to you too, mm-hmm. because genitals love vibrations. I love that. I love that. I love that. It's like, I, I thought, um, with the, the raft example is so funny. It's like, Oh, and my, and my boyfriend didn't even mention it, but me and the raft, we had such a great day together. It's so funny. And it's so true. What about my, what about my moms, my moms who are sleep deprived, you know, healing from, from labor, the emotional, the physical, the chemical, uh, process of being, uh, you know, pregnant and delivering a child. Um, a lot of times, uh, part of the post care for these women is like, Oh, you're good to go. Now you're good to go and have sex. And and they're like, I'm not there yet. Like, I'm so tired. My body hurts. Uh, you know, I remember the first time after my babies were born, I mean, now they're 11 and, and nine, but I remember the first, you know, the first time I sat down on the toilet after I, you know, gave birth, I was like, I'm going to split. Like this is not going to be like, I was so nervous. So you can imagine, you know, some of the apprehension that, you know, a new mom and new mom could be, you know, six month old baby, nine month old baby. Um, what do you say to those women that are like, my libido is just different. Like it's just different now. How can we support these women and the communication that they're having with their partner? Actually, that's, I'm so glad you asked because that is the topic of my first book. My first book is called A Tired Woman's Guide to Passionate Sex. And I talk about that, that of course you're not going to feel the same after a baby for a variety of physical and psychological and emotional reasons. You're exhausted and your hormones are raging and you've your body's just been through this whole thing and All you want to do is like when you have a moment is sleep and you're not going to feel horny. I mean, but the thought that you should is like, again, here we go with these shoulds. Right. And what I want to say is what people just like they don't know about the clit. What drives me crazy is that people have never been taught something that's really essential. And that is there is there are two types of sexual desire spontaneous sexual desire and receptive sexual desire. Spontaneous is I feel horny. Receptive is I'm, I'm open to the idea of sex because I know there'll be positive outcomes. Like it'll be good once it gets going. And so many people think there's only one type being horny. So when they stop being horny naturally, based on childbirth, based on just being in a relationship for a long time. We know that after uh, six months to two years, women generally stop feeling horny for their partners. Like that's, there's, there's biological reasons for that, which, but the bottom line is like, first of all, take your time. Don't have any sexual relations till you're ready. Talk about it with your partner But at the same time, we also know that sexless marriages are most likely to start postpartum. And I don't mean two weeks postpartum. I mean, someone whose baby's like a year old and they're still not making room or time or space in their life as their sex. So what you can do in that case is, I know that it sounds so unsexy, planned sexual encounters. That's why I like to call them trysts instead because that's a sexier word what's a tryst it's a planned meeting between lovers and what that does is it allows you to get your brain and your body ready save some energy and i don't advocate having your tryst at night you know it could be during the weekend when the baby's napping you know it could be hiring a babysitter and instead of going out to dinner go to a hotel room and bring you know candles in a picnic or whatever 
but don't, you know, it's okay to reverse the equation. It's okay to have sex to get horny rather than waiting to be horny to have sex. Mm -hmm. That is so great because I think that so many women can resonate with that and say, yeah, once you, once it gets going, you're like, why don't we do this more often? This is great. (laughs) I appear in that so much. Like once it's so good when it gets going, we should do this more often. And then Of course you don't. And then people also call that duty sex. And I say, no, no. If it's good once it gets going, it's not duty sex. Using another metaphor, I don't, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, snow capital of the world, right? Before I had a drive to high school, right? I'd have to scrape the snow off my car. I had to run it for like five minutes to get it warm enough to drive. Our bodies can be like that. I still had a nice drive to school, but it needed a warm up. Right. And that's the same thing. I love that. And I think that that also gets rid of some of that shame too, because, and from an evolutionary perspective, it would be, um, it wouldn't make sense for a new mother to be horny and like, or even, you know, of a, of a young child, right. For her to be like, man, I just can't wait. I can't wait for Can't wait for the big D because, you know, she has a child to take care of. Right. So we want to be, we also want to think about this from an evil. It's normal. There's no shame in it. And I love the idea of this receptive desire that once, you know, uh, you get, you get it going, uh, you know, you have it in the calendar. It gives you both something to look forward to, you know, you do a little dress, you do get a little makeup on, do a little effort, kind of get in the thing. And then, and then it can turn into just a beautiful opportunity for connection. I think that that's just lovely, just lovely. Yeah, Yeah. it really, it really works. And, you know, when I have clients who come to me to say, you know, I have sex, you know, out of obligation, it's duty sex. And I ask, do you enjoy it? They say, yes, it's great. Once it gets going, I'm like, then why is it duty sex? It's just, It's a little bit like the vibrator myth, right? Like vibrators are like they're they they're they substitute for men. It's it's another myth that sex should be spontaneous. And you you know, like think about I talk to people about sex was never spontaneous, it was always planned. Think about it before you had kids, before you were moving in together, say you were going out for a date. I was just talking to a client yesterday. During a session, she wanted to get off early because she wanted to put on her makeup and shower and, you know, get all, you know, fancy, put on her best undies, whatever, because she was going on a date. So what happens is we do that and we get showered, you know, looking our best, whatever. We flirt all night long and oh, oh my gosh, the night ends in sex. That wasn't spontaneous. That was well orchestrated. It was still planned. And so once we can get rid of the idea that sex should be spontaneous and blow that myth, it really opens the door to planned encounters. And also think about it. You're a mom. I'm I'm, actually, my daughters are both grown. I have a 28 and a 31 year old. So, but I still remember, you know, those years, like, no, you're not going to do anything spontaneously. Do you, like you and I would not have been on uh, Zoom at the fir- the same time, yeah. <laughs> right. you know, fil- we didn't like spontaneously decide to show up at the same time and film this podcast. Right. We have very busy lives, you know, so we had to put it in the calendar or it wouldn't have happened. Same with right. going to the gym or yoga or f- to coffee with a friend. You know, the things we used to do before the pandemic, but right, right. <laughs> the it's the same with sex. It's not going to happen unless you plan for it. And once you know that planned sex can just be lovely. It can just be lovely. I think that's perfect. I think that's so amazing. So, we, so tell us, okay, so doc, tell us where, you know, if there's, I know that this what we've talked about today, I think so many of my audience, maybe some of them have heard a lot of this. They're very familiar. Maybe this has been just a complete eye opener. So if they want to learn more about you and your work, tell me where I can direct them. I know that we I'll put a link for the book, uh, Becoming Cliterate, uh, and your first book as well, A Tired Woman's Guide to Pleasure. To Passionate Sex. Oh, to pa- oh pardon me, To Passionate that's Sex. Okay. I'll make sure that that's right in the show notes. Where else can we find you? Where I mean, I think your Instagram is just... Thank such a, you. such Thank a great you. resource, but where, where can we find you? So, yeah. And I think of my Instagram as bite-sized pieces of sex education. Um, 
So you can find me on my website, which is www.drlaurimintz.com, D-R-L-A-U-R-I-E-M-I-N-T-Z.com. And there you can find links to both of my books on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, indie bookstores. You can see my TED Talk. And um, you can also find my social media. I'm on Instagram primarily, but I'm also on Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. Um, and all of my social media is linked at my website and all my handles are the same, Dr. Lori Mintz. Perfect. We will have clickable links in the show notes. Fabulous. Dr. Mintz, I just love your work. Uh, I just want to applaud you. It is, um, I, I think what we really, what is really needed in a sometimes toxic patriarchal world is the reclamation of the feminine and female pleasure, I think is at the forefront of that. Cause when we can feel good in our bodies, we can, we are better, you know, we, we enjoy our lives better, which is, I think just the point, you know, our bodies are designed, especially the clitoris designed for pleasure, but it, it extends and it bleeds into, into other verticals uh, of our lives. We are better mothers. We are better lovers. We are better community leaders. And I think that this is um, how we change the world. So thank you so much for your work. I've just enjoyed our talk so much. I love, love what you're putting out there. I I have really enjoyed it too. And if I have one moment to just underscore something you said, and this was a surprise to me after I published Becoming Clitorate, I would get notes from women saying, not only did I become orgasmic, but once I became empowered in the bedroom, my life was happier outside. I felt more confident at work. I was more assertive with friends. Like so too many times we hear the reverse, right? Like learn all these skills and then apply them to the bedroom. But I really have found if we empower women in the bedroom, they're more empowered in their life in general. So thank you for underscoring that. Thank you. Thank you so much.